<laughs> what are the other ones? Or is it like, Evan Uncle Mauricio, Vittorio? My dad's French, so it's all like the, it was all, it, it, he, and he and a bunch of his brothers, and it was all, yeah, Francois and uh, <laughs> Christian and Bernard. Nice. All right, first question. Um, since, uh, why do you think the musical genre has been such difficult to revive, which, which he has done so well? And from what I read, this film was, uh, you had a uh, plan since six years, right? So... Yeah, what something was, like that. So yeah. what was one of the major, main obstacles for you? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it was, uh, I mean, it was a couple of things. I mean, but yeah, one of it was just uh, pe people's reaction when they hear that we want to do a musical, you yeah. know. And uh, um, the only thing that has made musicals palatable, I think, for the past sort of certain stretch of years has been if they're based on pre-existing hits, you know. Um, so, but Justin and I, we were working on this before we even did Whiplash. So it's just like, you know, these two, we're just two people saying, uh, we want to do a musical that's already a turn off. Um, we want to do a musical where, you know, we, like Justin, is going to write all the music um, and I'm going to direct it. None of us have done anything, so that's another turn off, you know. And so I think it was just this, this, uh, this risk upon risk upon risk that made the project not not that appealing for a while until we did do Whiplash and until we kind of got our foot in the door enough to convince people to maybe uh, take a swing. Yeah, and we love musicals. Uh, Damien turned me on to a lot of uh, musicals I didn't know in college, so these are the kinds of movies that um, you know I personally watch um, just for pleasure. And um, you know I, th I think it's kind of the adage of make what you want to watch or make the kind of art that you are a fan of. Um, so uh, we were just making something that, you know, spoke to us and that was the kind of movie that we would want to see. And, um, and yeah, it's, uh, it's, people seem to be, you know, responding, responding to the, the characters in the story. And I think at the end of the day, you know, even if musicals, quote unquote, have gone out of style for, you know, a certain period of time, I think it comes down to the story and, um, you know, like any other movie, um, you know, if people connect to it. Then hopefully, uh, you know, it's it, they'll want to watch it. So following up on that, <clears throat> why did you choose like, like why did you incorporate the tropes and style of like mid-century musicals to tell a story about today? Uh, I think I mean in a way that was part of the that was part of the idea was uh, I mean not specific I guess not as period specific as that but just. Just, you know, that you look at this genre that, for whatever reason, yeah, did go out of style, um, you know, after the, you know, basically after the 60s, and uh, at least for a while. Um, and so you look at it from the, you know, 30s through the 50s, or through the 60s, and, and you know, movies that Justin and I loved, and try to, you know, we're sort of asking ourselves, what can these movies teach us about today, and what, um, what... What is it about them that actually could apply today? You know, and I think um, I think it's actually, in a way, you know, sort of. I, I, I think because the genre had, you know, sort of a hard time uh, after the '60s. You know, it's 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 thought of as this sort of old-fashioned genre, but it's really not. There's really like a, a there's 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 sort of a defiance and a willfulness to break rules that's sort of inherent to the genre. This idea that you know that emotions can 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 justify breaking into song, breaking into dance, that to me feels, um, in a way, to me, it seems like it'll always feel modern. Um, it's just about how you approach it, you know? Um, and, um, and I think what has made the musical feel old-fashioned uh, in, you know, recent decades has just been, just been everything just kind of getting heavy and laden with effect and affectation. Um, so we thought that if you could just kind of cut through that and just get to the simplicity of two people dancing because they're in love, or two people singing because they're in love, or someone singing because uh, her heart's been broken, you know, that, that, that there could just be a simple emotional through line like that, and you set it in today's world, you, you cast people who an audience can go on the ride with, you shoot it in real locations in a real city, that if you could just do that, um, then um, and, 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 and didn't try to chase fads, didn't try to make the music feel like, you know, uh, uh, like it was aping what stuff you hear on the radio today, you know, didn't, didn't make any of that feel like it was trying to chase any specific kind of time, um, that it would feel current, that it would feel timeless, it would feel 
that it would feel like it was made for today. That was at least the sort of the, the hope. And we were also trying to make sure it didn't feel like an old fashioned movie either. So, you know, one of my biggest challenges with the music was just making sure that, you know, I'm certainly inspired by all sorts of, you know, we're both inspired by the same musicals. A lot of those are, all of those are older musicals for the most part. Um, but at the same, t but at the same time, making sure that the songs don't feel like they were actually written in the 50s or 60s or 40s. Um, you know, certain approaches um, we've taken, you know, that were taken back then, like all the music is orchestral, there's nothing electronic um, outside of the one pop song in the movie. Um, so that's definitely an older approach, um, you know, and something that brings a warmth and a humanity to the score in the songs, I think. Um, but just from a compositional standpoint and, you know, an orchestration standpoint, um, it, it was our goal not to sound like an old fashioned musical to, to sort of be inspired by what we love, but also make something that just sort of feels like its own thing. And in that way, hopefully feels modern or, um, or not from any particular time, just, you know, kind of a new, a new piece. And there are... Um, a few just really, um, I don't know, magical melodies uh, in the songs, um, simple stuff that, uh, in my experience in uh, talking to musicians, uh, those melodies that are so simple and yet so kind of classic, or you just kind of find them, or they find you, they're hard, they don't, you can't really engineer them. Um, was, was that your experience in, in writing these songs? I think some of those melodies are really great. Yeah, thank you. Um, Damien and I spend uh, a lot of time, um, um, you know, working on finding the, the melodies and the themes of a movie, and I think this is a process um, that we do, have done in the past, um, and will do whether it's a musical or not, just because we, we believe that, you know, movies w should have themes, whether it's the main theme of the movie or, in the case of a musical, song melodies that really stick with you. And... Um, and it's not easy to find those melodies um, for me or for, I, I think, a lot of composers. So we go through many, many, you know, I, I send him many piano demos and we go over mm -hmm. a lot of things until one just strikes him as that is one that I believe is going to, you know, stick with people. Um, and when, you know, I, Damien um, says, says no to a lot of, a lot of, a lot of my melodies, but when one finally sticks when he says that's the one you know I'm the first one to recognize I'm glad we it took 25 tries to get there other melodies um, came you know faster like the audition melody was um, thank you that that was actually sort of my first try at that um, so some, some of the melodies um, take longer than others um, I do think that melody is not really something you can teach um, it's just kind of um, an instinct for the way notes follow each other and the way that that music can unfold in a narrative way. Um, so um, in that sense, like you say, I think it does, it is kind of um, inside you um, in, in some ways, but, um, but our process is actually a very long process in terms of you know, find, in terms of actually deciding on the melodies that we believe in strongly enough to put in a movie. Thank you. Can you talk about the logistics of the opening uh, song and dance number on the on the highway, which I think is just like one of my favorite sequences in a movie this year. I mean, how how oh, elaborate did you have to plan to pull that off? Uh, it was. Uh, <laughs> it was. Yeah, I, th I think it was like this. Uh, the sequence that like hung hung like a cloud over everyone <laughs> towards the like lead up to making it because it was because it was it, it wasn't going to be easy to pull off and it it, it was also you know at, at part of the fun of it but also part of the challenge was that you know um, it was a kind of sequence that we needed to you know do in the in the spirit of some of the older musicals we've been talking about but those musicals were shot on on you know for the most part on back lots and 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 against painted sets, um, this was going to be a real freeway and uh, uh, with real traffic going underneath it. And so, um, so it, was, it was that kind of the gambit was like, let's see if this can actually work in a, in a more or less real environment, you know? Um, 
And so that, that's, that's what I liked about, you know, about doing it and, and about some of the very, the wider kind of angles you get towards the end of that number that you, yeah, you're seeing the sort of very staged choreography and, and, and cars that are obviously very designed and staged, but underneath you're seeing three or more lanes of traffic going that are, that's just a documentary basically, <laughs> you know. So you separate one part of the frame, you have a documentary, another part of the frame you have as far from a documentary as you can get. Um, so I, I uh, so that was exhilarating to me. It, it created a lot of headaches for our line producer and for uh, uh, all the people in charge of the logistics. Um, um, but it was an easy pass ramp that we were able to convince LA, you know, the city of LA, to shut down. Um, we shot on a weekend, Saturday and Sunday, um, and uh, and so you know, kind of like before dawn, all the cars were kind of put into place, and then right at dawn, we started. We'd start rehearsals, and then right once the light was good, we'd start shooting, um, and we did that for the you know two consecutive days until until the light ran out, um, and uh, um, and all the things that happen in a real environment that threaten to fuck you up, you know, uh, like happened through, like clouds. Uh, the second day it was cloudy until midday, and the song's called Another Day of Sun, so we're, <laughs> we're like really bummed out about that. Um, and then there's a moment, you know, halfway through the number where a truck, you know, it's sort of climactic moment where a truck door has to open at a certain time. And of course the truck door decided to, after working fine in rehearsal, decided to not work anymore. And so we had to have people like holding a pulley behind the truck uh, maybe you were even one of them, Justin, I don't know, but like it was like literally like it wasn't just crew guys, like our producers had to like get involved. We had to have everyone on hand pulling like these ropes behind the truck, queuing it to queuing it to open with when this guy looks like he's opening it on screen. Um, so all these things that like are just part of byproducts of, you know, shooting in an uncontrolled, somewhat uncontrolled environment that you just have to go by. So it's it's it, it was a nerve wracking experience shooting it, but but uh but it was kind of like I wouldn't. Ha I kind of wouldn't have it any other way. I missed that scene since I was stuck in traffic. <laughs> well, <I> mean, <laughs> that's a good. That's a good reason, though. Were you singing? Uh, no, I wish I was panicking. I want to try to get the singing as fast as possible. <laughs> I tried to not to have an accident. <laughs> How did the colors, um, the order of it, inform you of the makeup of your scenes? Since it was a, a, a very extensive use of colors in this film. Yeah, I was, I was really, uh, me and my, and my um, I mean, all the department heads, really, the, you know, the, the, the DP, Linus Sangren, and David Wasco, our production designer, Mary Zoffrey is our costume designer, all of them, um, all of us were, were really inspired by the old Technicolor movies, and, and, and I think it's, it's specifically because there was a time in movie making when color felt fresh, you know, and felt like... Uh, um, you know, from early, early stuff like, you know, like uh, The Adventures of Robin Hood or Gone with the Wind uh, into the 40s and then obviously into the great 50s color musicals, the, um, there was that feeling you felt like filmmakers were, were, uh, were given this like new tool that they wanted to play with and be expressive with. Um, and, 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 uh, and, 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 and when color, when black and white was the default, a color movie had to justify itself being in color, you know? Um, so I think uh, now color is just taken for granted. Now you have to justify yourself being in black and white if you want to do that. That's the radical thing to do. But back then it was color and, and, um, and so, uh, so you really felt like color was part of the story with those movies. It was part of the emotional landscape. It was part of the terrain. It was, it was uh, uh, the same way that the music would be scoring emotions. The color was, was kind of scoring emotions in a different way. And so we really kind of were fascinated by that and, and wanted to try, to try to do that and make the colors feel as saturated as they do in those old movies, really feel, put blues in the blacks, make sure that every, you know, so that sh even shadows had a kind of a blue tint to them and so that you would feel like, you would feel that everything was, nothing was ever black and white, that even scenes that would seem kind of monochromatic had color kind of in the corners, you know, um, or, or simmering underneath. Um, and that and that certain colors would mean certain things that like the the color green for example Emma wears green during the planetarium dance and that that would kind of be her color and so her her little keepsakes early on in the movie are, are, are green and then later on green becomes this sort of color that is sort of the color of what 
doesn't exist in the relationship anymore. You know, it's mm-hmm. the color of Sebastian's, uh, of the light outside Sebastian's apartment when they, when the relationship starts to fall apart. And so things like that were, um, it was just fun to have conversations like that about how you can use color to, to say emotional things that the music or dialogue uh, 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 is not saying and say it in conjunction with them. All right, so a big theme in La La Land is the power of jazz, which has been a motif in both of your previous films as well. What keeps bringing you back to jazz in your films? I think uh, it's, it's probably just that it's, um, you know, we all draw from stuff we've been through personally, and a big part of my growing up was, was hearing jazz in the household. My dad kind of trying to trying desperately to get me into jazz, and then me starting to play jazz myself, and then, um, and then playing jazz drums all through high school um, uh, with a crazy conductor. <laughs> and, uh, and so like that whole, uh, it was just a very formative time of my life and part of my life. So, I, I, um, um, so jazz for me is not, it's not just music, it's, it's very much kind of just like, it's, it's a lot of memories, it's a lot of my childhood, it's a lot of emotion. It's just sort of baked into that music. Um, and I remember when, when Justin and I first started rooming in college and playing music together in college, I came more from the jazz background. You, you kind of came more from classical background. And so we kind of met in the middle in a way. And, um, um, and in a way, I guess that's where some of our favorite musicals lived as well. It was, you know, that they're, they're fundamentally jazz movies. Um, uh, uh, you know, that they, they swing, they're syncopated. That allows you to dance a certain way but they're orchestrated like uh, Tchaikovsky, Mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I talked to you about Whiplash, uh, I was telling you about how like the the ending just, I was just overwhelmed by the ending. Uh, Here, the the opening and closing numbers had the same effect on me. And when we were talking about Whiplash, uh, you said um, that moments like that ending sequence are really like what you kind of do this for. And we were talking about it, people kind of overvalued plot a lot of mm. the times in movies and you, you you're talking about how you really just want to get to that those moments those cin- purely cinematic moments right. same approach for this movie I assume has your philosophy changed at all um, yeah it's it's sort of like um, you know plot has to be a means to an end I think you know I think uh, as soon as plot becomes the end um, you should just read that there's no reason to see it on a screen so I think uh, um, so ideally, um, you know, I, th- I think the, the best pieces of cinema, you know, use story as a, as a like the story and the plot allows, uh, allows you a space to, you need it in order to provide the emotional substance and the pretext for everything, but it allows you a space to open up into something that you can't describe in words. Um, and, and maybe that's why I, I love dealing with music and, and working with Justin and putting music on screen because it's, you know, just that idea of getting to a place where emotions are communicated. Uh, I mean, it's ironic for me as a writer, but getting to a place where emotions are communicated not through words is always kind of the end goal. And often you need to use words on your road to that, but it's kind of like the, it's where I really get my juices flowing is when you can get into that sort of state of just, uh, of just uh, you know, sort of somewhat more abstract state. Yeah, and it's a, it's a dream for a composer for the assignment to be to create music that can help resolve a story in as um, you know fundamental a way as it does in this movie. Um, you know, because the the being able to compose sort of for narrative and emotional um, reasons is is the most fulfilling type of composition. Um, the you know the type of score that um, is less interesting would be you know kind of just a, a pad under everything you know mm-hmm. that kind of score um, whereas you know in this score um, pops up at times when you really have to find sort of emotional counterpoint to what's going on in the movie and in the case of the closing number you know that we've just talked about it's really kind of guiding us through um, the last stages of that story, um, you know, in conjunction with the, you know, unbelievable production design and, and, you know, everything else that's going on in that sequence. So, um, yeah, it was really sort of a a dream for me to be able to sort of create 
you know, compose and orchestrate this sequence that, um, that could do so much um, emotionally um, for us at the end of the movie. Incredible. Yeah. So the, the morning uh, that I watched La La Land, I watched that in the afternoon, that morning I screened that thing you do for my students, <laughs> which is Tom Everett Scott, who was essentially the writer. I love that movie. Yeah. Well, so, so mere hours later, here's Tom Everett Scott, 20 <laughs> years later, sitting in a jazz club again. Is that just remarkable coincidence? Well, no, I mean, I, I, I certainly, I became a big fan of Tom Everett Scott through that thing you do. Um, and... Uh, uh, but then I, I've loved him as an actor um, ever since then. So I was just kind of, I was really, I was sort of like a little fanboy, I think, when I, when I actually like found out he might actually be willing to do this movie. Um, and, uh, and actually, funny enough, Emma and Ryan were the same. They, they I, did, I didn't, I, you know, for me, growing up as a drummer, that thing you do had a special importance in one of the few movies that highlighted the drummer in the band, you know. Um, but uh, I didn't expect it to kind of mean that much to Emma and Ryan. And then Emma, at some point during prep, like asked me, like, "Oh, so who's uh, who's playing uh, my husband at the at the end of the movie?" I said, "Oh, well, I don't, I don't know. You probably haven't worked with him. His, his name is Tom Everett Scott." And so she just stops me and immediately goes, "That thing you do." <laughs> and, then, and then like, and then like she's like says, "Ryan, guess who's playing my husband?" It's like hey, Tom Everett Scott. And Ryan's like. That thing you do, <laughs> and they just like quote the movie for the entire shoot. They probably like drove, <laughs> they might have drove Tom crazy because they were even big bigger fanboys than I was. Yeah, <laughs> so no, I'm uh, I love that movie, and apparently a lot of other people do too. <laughs> Great fan. Yeah. Um, since um, uh, it wasn't immediate that uh, Ryan and Emma wasn't your first choice to play the leads, um, how does it does it change uh, from you from your original vision to the actually have them in the, in well, the movie? It, the irony was actually that uh, uh, when when Justin and I were first first working on this movie, like you know, in script stage uh, in like 2010, um, we were all already talking about Emma and Ryan, but kind of as as pipe dreams. They were like the the sort of you know, and yeah, it'll be Emma and Ryan thinking that that was almost a joke. That you know, but they were they were kind of the barometer of what the type of persona we wanted on screen. And then in the five years that it took to get off the ground, the casting went through tons of different permutations, and the, there were lots of different individual castings and also different pairings, and you know, certain things would come together and then fall apart. Financing would come together and then fall apart. And it would be this constant up and down that every time felt like this horrible, you know, every time we would lose a piece either of casting or of money, it felt like, uh, felt like the, you know, the ceiling was collapsing on us. Um, but of course, looking back, I mean, the fact that it then wound up through all that, winding back up in Ryan and Emma's laps is, uh, you know, is sort of taught me to, you know, look for the silver lining in every cloud <laughs> a little bit. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Much. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Good luck at the Oscars. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.